Uh, we've been talking uh, about a, a series we entitled Godopoly, and uh, I like to share that I just was praying about God, what, what can we talk on here to start the new year? And uh, there were a lot of different, I always like to talk about spiritual disciplines when you start the new year because uh, everybody's kind of in the mood to uh, have resolutions and start the year off by being disciplined about things. And God was just showing me how so many of these things tie into the game Monopoly. And uh, so we got a little bit cre uh, creative. Today's subtitle is Community Chess or Chance. You know, there's two decks of cards on that Monopoly board. One is like reddish and one is yellow. And oftentimes you fall on a spot on that board that says Chance or Community Chess and you pick up one of those cards. I did a little research and in those deck of cards, I looked at every little card of what each one was. And there's a huge chance if you pull the chance card from the chance deck that you're going to be paying money. But if you pull from the community chess deck, the chances are uh, it's going to be a blessing to you in some sort of way. There's one or two cards in there that might result in you having to pay something. But most of it is, is a blessing to you. And so this morning, we want to kind of focus on God's biblical principle of the church being a community chess. Look what it says here in Acts chapter 2. We're going to start reading in verse 42. Talking about the disciples, Jesus ris, uh, rose from the grave. He went up into heaven. He's left the, the church in the hands of the disciples. And uh, Peter has just preached this incredible sermon. And thousands of people got saved. The day of Pentecost had just happened where the Holy Spirit came and, and filled the, the, the upper room where they were meeting and praying. And it says that after all of this, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold their possessions and goods, and they gave to anyone as he had need. Look what it goes on to say in the fourth chapter of Acts, verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. So the ways of the early church <coughs> was this principle called community chess. There was a system where they took anything that they had that maybe they had an abundance of. It says here some people sold property, some people sold goods that they had extras of. And in chapter 4, it says, uh, neither did anyone say the things that he possessed was his own. This is a great principle that God expects us as believers in the church. Everything that I own isn't mine. It all belongs to God. This is the way God views us. And so God expects us to, to take the things that he's given to us, if we really believe they came from him, and to use them to be a blessing to other people, to use them for his kingdom, to use them for his glory and for his honor. So they didn't count their possessions as their own, but they would take of their possessions. And, and I wrote the word excess here, and I, I'm not even certain that it was even their excess. You know, I, I'm not looking to do what some of the modern day cults to ask, ask you to sell everything you have and let's all pool our resources together. That I, I don't want to go to that extreme, but I do believe that it is the responsibility of all of us, if we are truly the family of God, to support the needs of our family and to support the needs of the church. And I tell you, we are a church that does that unlike most churches that I know. You know, there's been many people in the church, uh, and some of them are here this morning, that, you know, we've helped them keep their electricity on. We've helped them stay in their home that they were in danger of losing. We helped get them get their car fixed so they could get a job and get back on their feet. Many of the testimonies that you hear on our Vision Sunday are people who, whose lives we've helped them so that financially they could deal with something and, and so that spiritually God could bless them. You know, I believe in this principle in God's Word. When Jesus was uh, preaching on the hillside to the 5,000 and people, he said, you know, I'm really not going to get too, through to them spiritually until I deal with their natural needs. They're hungry. They're, 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 they haven't eaten all day. And, and I can't really impart anything I want to into them spiritually until we take care of their physical needs, their natural needs. And I believe it's that way really in the church, that God would have us to pool our resources together to take care of people's needs and to care for each other. Now, I believe there's also a balance to that. I believe that there are people that need to be taught that squander their money, that are not good with money. And I'm not one to just throw money in, into good money after uh, bad, good money after bad. Is that the saying? Yeah. Good money after bad or to throw money into a hole where somebody is, is just going to misuse it and squander it. So 
This was God's system, though, to provide not only for the needs of the church, but to provide for the people's needs. You say, Pastor, how, how does that happen? Our God is so awesome. He's so amazing. He has these concepts that just don't make sense to our mind. But God's system of providing for your needs is by you giving money away. You say, Pastor, how, how, do, how is that? That just doesn't make sense. It's, it's a, a, a system called sowing and reaping. That if you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. If, if you take a seed, and that's what he calls our, our finances, and you plant it in the ground. If I, if I had an apple seed here this morning, and, and I were to plant it out here in our backyard of the church, after a little while, I'd get an apple tree. And after a while, on that tree would be lots of apples. And each one of those apples would contain a number of different seeds. Let's just say 20 seeds per apple. If I had 100 apples on that tree, and there were 20 seeds in every apple, that's 2,000 seeds, right? from one seed. And you think to yourself, well, how can God do that? He can take your money, the Bible says, and, and multiply it and, 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 and take it and, and uh, uh, cause it to grow. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over is what the Bible says. He'll give it back to you. He'll multiply it and give it back to you. Why? Because you're trusting him with it. Because you're putting it in his hands. You put it in the hands of the master and God can do incredible things with it. This is God's system, number two, a financial provision for all, for everybody. And you know, there's a lot of people that they, they talk about things that are, are Old Testament versus New Testament. In Malachi chapter 3, the prophet Malachi is talking here about this system that God uh, has for us. And it's something that Jesus endorsed in the New Testament. In fact, Jesus took it a, a step further. He said, sell everything you have. He, he didn't just talk about tithing. He talked about giving everything you have away to help people in need. But here in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, it says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Speaking of the church, God's house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I, and see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour out uh, for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine uh, fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> now, I just want you to know this morning, you may say, oh, here's another pastor talking about money. I'm not talking about this for my personal benefit. This is a system that God has set up to provide for your needs. My wife and I have been married for 32 years. And in all of our married life, we have participated in this system. And I, I got to tell you, there have been times where money was really tight. Raising two kids and not making a lot of money. And times that I was out of work before uh, in the past, before I became a full-time pastor. And even as a full-time pastor, I, I, I remember when I decided to go uh, leave my job and come here full-time to work at the church, I took a $20,000 a year pay cut. And you, you want to talk about some difficult times with two little kids at home and, and uh, you know, Lynn not, not really having a, a full-time job as well. It was a big step of faith. But through it all, we have participated in God's financial plan. And God has not only provided for our needs, God has blown us away at how much he's blessed us. I was sharing on Wednesday night a few weeks ago that I'm almost embarrassed for people to see how God has blessed us because he's poured out blessings upon us that have just been overwhelming to us and incredible to us. But this is how he does it, through this system of, of giving, this system of tithing. The word tithe means tenth. And I believe that it's talking here about a tenth of our income, that we give the first fruits all throughout the Bible. There's a principle of the first fruits, that you bless God with the first fruits of your increase, with the first fruits of your income, with the first fruits of whatever it is. You know, that's why we, 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 we do things in the church, even beyond finances. We give them the first part of our day. We give them the first day of our week. It's the, the, the blessing of the first fruits. And when you take that and you honor it and you put it aside for God, I believe this principle goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. When God told Adam, all these trees in the garden, you can eat freely of all of them, but there's a portion here. There's one that I want you to keep for me. And he says, if you, if you do this, if you honor me in this, living you'll live. You'll, you'll feed off of the life of God. You'll feed off of the life of heaven. You'll have an incredible spiritual experience with God. All of your needs will always be provided. Do you know back then God never really intended for Adam to work? There was no such thing as a job. 
God provided for all of Adam's needs. He didn't have to work back then. As long as he honored God and didn't touch that portion which belonged to God. But we all know the story. Adam took that which belonged to God. And he took it for his own personal consumption. And and, and sin began to enter. And all of a sudden man had to work to to, to make ends meet. And and to bring uh, uh, his living out of the the fruit of the ground. and, And digging and sweat, the Bible says, and things like that. That was never God's plan or intention. God wanted to provide for us by us just honoring him and keeping a portion reserved unto him. Here in Malachi, it says uh, that there will uh, be meat in God's house. I already touched on that. That if we give into God's kingdom, it's his way for providing for his house. Now, there's a lot of blessings that you guys uh, are able to receive from here in God's house. First of all, we have the heat on today. Aren't you glad about that? We have a nice heated building, a heated sanctuary. We have electricity. Uh, you know, we have some some nice amenities like uh, sound systems and projectors and screens, and and we produce some cool videos for our offering and things like that. We have insurance. If you were to slip and fall in the parking lot today, it would hopefully be covered by our insurance, things like that. We have a lot of different things, but we also have some wonderful staff members, people that, that are a blessing to you. We've got one of the, the, the most incredible young worship leaders that I think you're going to see anywhere out there. And I don't say that just because he's, he's my son. He has done an awesome and incredible job with our worship team and taken it to a level that I never thought that we could get to. We have incredible people that are leading our children downstairs and, and, and that are leading our teenagers downstairs. We've got incredible people behind the scenes with administration and bookkeeping and things like that. Do you know that those people expect to get paid for what they do? Amen, Pastor. <laughs> they expect to get paid. That's how they take care of their family. That's how they feed their kids. And because we love them and appreciate what they do, we have to have meat in the storehouse to be able to pay them so we can take care of them. And i got to tell you this, they're all grossly underpaid. I'm the only one really that I don't think is grossly underpaid uh, around here. And I, I'm a little afraid because they're so awesome and they're so good that somebody's going to offer them a, a, a better opportunity somewhere, a little bit more money, and they're worth it. They're well worth it. And we may lose them if we don't start putting more meat in the storehouse to take care of these people, to take care of their needs, to take care of, uh, of, of them. And they deserve it. They've got families to feed and bills to pay just like you guys do. So this is God's system to put meat in his house, but it's also God's system to bless you. He says, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings upon you. Then he says that you won't have room enough to receive. He's not the God of just getting by. He's not the God of hanging in there. You know, I get a, a kick out of people. How you doing? I'm hanging in there. I'm getting by. That, that's not my God. My God is El Shaddai. He's the God of more than enough. He's the God of leftovers. He's the God that wants to open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings upon you that you would not have room enough to receive. And all he's looking for you to do is just to trust him with the first fruits, with the, the first part, with a portion, with a tenth of what he brings into your house. And i got to say, I've experienced windows of heaven blessings in my life. That God has poured out things that, that I don't have room enough to receive. You know how I know that? We moved a couple years ago. And I tell you, all the stuff that we had, I didn't have room enough to move it. I had to sell some of it and, and get rid of some of it and give some of it away and, and throw some stuff out because I didn't have room enough for all my stuff. You guys accumulate a lot of stuff over the years. You know what I'm saying? We moved into a bigger house and I still didn't have room for all the stuff. It goes on in this passage to say, He will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Who's the devourer? The Bible says there's a thief that comes to kill and steal and destroy. Satan wants to steal from you. But you know, when you honor God with your finances and you participate in this community chest system, God covers your money. He blesses your money. He protects your money. God can do more with 90% of your money then you can do with 100% of it. How many of you can believe that? Amen? I mean, i got to trust that God can do more with 90% than I can do with 
I'd rather give him that 10% and, and ensure that he blesses and protects the other 90% than for me to consume that part that belongs to him and have Satan come in and, and my car broke down and my water heater broke down and I got doctor bills piling up and, and this happened and that happened. And, and it's happened to me in the past in my life. I know how the devourer can operate because I try to, to scrimp and, and cut corners and say, well, you know, maybe I, it's, you know, maybe if I give 8% or maybe, but I knew better. And God wasn't blessing my finances like he was when I turned it all over to him and said, God, I give it all to you. And he goes on and he talks here about fruitfulness. He says uh, that uh, the, the enemy, the devourer, will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall your vine fail to bear fruit in your field. There'll be a fruitfulness happen in your life. I just want to encourage you this morning. We're talking chance or community chest. Don't take chances. Do things God's way and you'll be blessed. When you're not honoring God and you're not doing things God's way, you're taking chances with your money. I think back to my younger days when, when I wasn't totally all into this kind of a system. I lost my job on a couple different occasions. There were times where I didn't know where our next meal was going to come from, how I was going to pay our bills, how we were going to make ends meet. And if you're there, it's because you're not trusting God. And you say, Pastor, but it doesn't make sense to give money away when that's what I need. It's an investment system. The same people that have this mentality will go down to the casino or buy a lottery ticket and trust the casino and trust the guy. Amen, somebody. Come on now. You got no problem giving money away there and trusting in a system that says, well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll hit it. Maybe my numbers will go. No, trust God's system. It hits every time. It pays off every time. We have a, a big vision this year. And this is the product of, of really a five-year plan that we've been praying through, a lot of prayer, a lot of research, a lot of meetings, a lot of conversations, a lot of talk with people in the communities. We've met with uh, architects and building companies and people that have done, uh, you know, different uh, types of uh, uh, research on, on feasibility studies and things like that, demographic studies. And we have determined that for us to really be the church that God wants us to be and to continue to grow, for us to be able to sustain what we have right now, that we need to build a new building. We need to build in a different location. And uh, one of the things that, that we've realized is that we are not able to reach the resources here that we need to be able to keep people like Stephen Misty on staff and Spencer on staff and other people that we've grown to love. And over the last three years, these guys have helped us really step up our game as a church. We have taken church to a whole nother level with our children's ministry, our youth ministry, our worship ministry, and other things like that. But we can't sustain this if we can't afford to be able to keep these people on staff. And so we have determined that the only way really to do that, and I know this doesn't make sense to some people, but is to move to a, a location where we can grow the church more. Whether you guys know it or not, and some people don't understand, our main source of income, and for most churches, the only source of income, is through us passing the plate on Sunday morning. If people don't participate in that, we can't pay our bills. That's how we live. That's how we feed our families. That's how we take care of, uh, of the bills and things like that around here. And, and, and in church life, that system has really struggled the last several years. In fact, our, our tithe income went down from 2017 to 2018. And, and if you guys, if your income was cut, it'd be hard for you to keep doing the things that you do. And that's one of the things that we're looking at right now. And we realize after 17 years in this building, we will never grow beyond where we are right now. We've hit this number, we've grown, we drop back. We hit it, we grow, we drop back. And so through prayer, through a, a strategy, strategies, I almost said strategizing, and, uh, and all kinds of things, just seeking God, he has impressed it upon our heart that this is what we need to do. This is what we, we, we need to do. And we need a facility that will attract more people. We need a facility where we can do church in, in a more relevant and current manner. We need a facility where, where uh, as we grow the church, we can change more lives. 
where we have a children's ministry that's not stuck in a basement downstairs or a youth ministry that you don't have to go through five different rooms to get there or offices that when the toilet overflows, the water doesn't come down on people's desks downstairs. We, 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 we just want a facility that is, is even laid out better. It's more functional. But more than that, it's more attractive. We have a heart to reach a lot of young families. There's a whole generation of people out there that, that, that haven't really heard the gospel of Jesus, that, that aren't uh, raised in church, that don't own a Bible, that, that, that have never talked about God or never prayed or sought God. And they'll never step foot inside of a, of a 60-year-old building that looks like a place that was built for their grandparents. And I'm not trying to be offensive this morning. I'm just being real. And realistically, that, that, that if you look at our church, if, if, We've got some wonderful saints and pillars and a lot of the people that do a lot of the volunteering around here and the giving around here and the support and the ones that come on Wednesday night and the prayer meetings, most of them are over 50 years of age. And if we keep growing in that demographic, we we love you all, but the church won't last forever. We want to build a church that, that what we put our sweat and our heart and our effort into, it, it will go on for years and generations to come. We want to build a place where your kids and your grandkids will want to come if you're grandparents and parents. A place where your families will all want to come together and worship together. And it's not happening here. And we believe that God has a place for us. But there's a cost to it. There's a cost to it. The Bible says in Luke chapter 14, And I believe these are the words of Jesus. He says, But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. So we have a building that we've designed. There's pictures of it in the lobby. In fact, if you guys can put the picture of it up on the screen, it's a beautiful place. It's something that, that we believe uh, will be very attractive to people. It's, it's in a, a neighborhood that's projected to grow in the next 10 years. You know, within a five-mile radius of our church, and this is a demographic study we did, just about every community in this, church, in this area is going to be declining, including this one that we're in right now. The two churches that were in this facility before we were died. They declined down to nothing. And so we found a place that was projected to grow a place where we believe we can reach more people. We found that people that live down in this community are are willing to drive a little bit north to find a great church and a great facility and things like that, whereas people that live out that way aren't willing to come down here to go to church. So it will enable us to reach more people. And we've had some estimates from some builders, and we believe that it's going to cost us somewhere around $1.7 million to build this facility. And... You know, one of the things that I like to say, we don't, we don't like to talk about money. We don't like to talk about our needs. We like to talk about our victories and, and, and all the triumphs and changed lives and things like that. But sometimes when we do that, we give people the impression that we got everything covered. There's, there's no need. Well, $1.7 million is a lot of money. And we have uh, right now in the bank towards that not enough that a, a bank would even approve us for a loan. Uh, we have probably about $170,000 put aside for this. So only about 10%. Now, you know if you go to, to build a building or get a mortgage, they want 20 25%. So we're not, we're not there. And so we are looking at different options for financing. And we found this wonderful company that finances church projects through selling bonds to the churches. <coughs> and a lot of our leaders have met with them. We had a meeting a couple weeks ago on a Wednesday night. These guys love God. Uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Tim Matheny, who made the presentation, is a former missionary. His, his uh, son's now a missionary. His parents were missionaries. And uh, he, he comes from a very godly, biblical perspective about these things. And so over the next couple months, you'll have an opportunity, actually, to invest in our building program by buying a church bond. We're not going to be pushy with it. We're not going to ask you to do more than what you can afford. In fact, I was really impressed in the sense that uh, the, the guy, Tim, that was giving the presentation on Wednesday night has turned people away because they couldn't afford to buy the bonds. He says, no, we're not going to let you buy it. That's too much. You can't afford that. So we, I just love their heart. They're just great people. But they're going to, through selling bonds to people in our church and people in, in, around the, the country that want to invest in our project, uh, instead of paying a bank interest, you guys can be making the interest 
on, on this investment. And other people, believers, who want to invest in our project, they can be making the interest on this. And so it's a way for you to be blessed. It's a way for you to take maybe a nest egg that you have set aside in an IRA or 401k or something like that, and without really much cost or penalty to you, just rolling it from where it's at to helping us. And uh, you can make up to 7% interest on that. And I'm not going to do a, a whole lot of presentation with that today. But you'll have an, uh, an opportunity to invest and to reap. But at the same time, our expenses will go up considerably because we'll have a mortgage to pay. And we've been able to, through the grace of God and through our, our, our daycare center, we've been able to save money here and there every month. But the amount of money that we're saving is only probably half or less than half of what our mortgage payment will be. And so we're going to use that nest egg for a couple years that we've saved, not to put as a down payment on the building, but to help make those payments until we start growing like we believe we will uh, after a couple years in that new facility, until we have the opportunity to figure out what we're doing here. Um, most likely we'll keep this facility because the daycare program here uh, brings in uh, a, an absorbent amount of money that it would be crazy to sell it. We'd be better off keeping it and increasing our daycare program here because that will help us to make the mortgage payments out there. Are you tracking with me? Amen. Now, here's one of the problems. And this is, again, something that's happening in the church world. Last year, our attendance went up. Last year, our church grew. We met some wonderful, beautiful people. Some of you are uh, have been such a blessing to our church. But our attendance went down. Or, excuse me, our income went down. In a time where we're trying to increase our monthly income, our weekly income, so that we can make these mortgage payments when we get there, our income went down. And some of that's because one of our our, our, our big givers has moved, and uh, we need some other people to step up and to fill those shoes. When you take the largest donor to your church and they move out of town, it makes it very difficult sometimes to continue the income at the same rate where you're at. And so we're asking some of you to step up. We need your help. And in addition uh, to uh, building the new building, we'll have to try to maintain this one. There'll be some cost of, you know, uh, utilities and, and maintenance and things like that. But again, it will be well worth it to keep it. The cost of paying this mortgage will be greater than where we are right now. But it's not greater than what we should be and what we can be as a church. It's not greater than our God, obviously. The other option, again, is to stay here and do nothing. And we will eventually go back down like we have in the past, like we've been doing for 17 years. We hit a height. We do really well. We celebrate a lot of victories. And then we begin to decline. And we go up and we decline. And I don't want to do that. I want to break through that glass ceiling. I want to become, after 24 years, the best 24 years of my life of pastoring this church. I figure I've got at least another 10 years in me. And I want to position our church in the next 10 years so that someday when I begin to transition and hand leadership off to some of these other young, great, gifted men of, of God, I'm not looking at leaving. I'll still be here. But at the same time, uh, I want to position our church where it will go on for another 100 years. And we need to do that. And that's a big part of what making this move is. And so we have a budget this year that we're not trying to put all of this on your shoulders. We've increased our daycare prices, so we'll increase some income there in our daycare. Um, we're going to look at renting our church out in the afternoon uh, sometime this year to maybe another church. We've done that in the past. That'll bring in some extra income uh, to help us to be able to make these mortgage payments. It'll be a little uncomfortable for us. You'll see people as you're hanging out in the lobby starting to roll in for another church service, but sometimes we have to use uh, alternate methods of income, and, and that's okay. We put together some uh, presentations, a little brochure. We want to go out into the business world. I've, I've hooked up with the Chamber of Commerce here in Warren. I'm going this Thursday to my first Chamber of Commerce meeting. The guy that runs it has a huge heart to help people in need. I've already had one business commit $10,000 to us this year. That's exciting. And so we're going to put some brochures together. If you want to help us, you know somebody that might want to help with that, I'll be glad to put one of those in your hand. Uh, there's a lot of people out there. The Bible says the wealth of the unjust is laid up for the work of God, for the just. Amen. And so I'm not against seeking money outside of the church for those types of things. But at the same time, we need to step up our game too. 
And I want to encourage you to begin to participate in this system that God has put in place to provide for your needs. And some of many of you are participating. You know, I, I put out this challenge this year, that $10 challenge. And I have to say that I, I didn't calculate into it that loss of income from, uh, from somebody that had moved. And so that $10, yes, will definitely be a big help to us. But we also need some people to step up and begin to tithe that maybe have not been tithing. Maybe you've been given 5%. Step it up to 6 or 7 or 8 And And honestly, really, to, to get in with God's program, it should be 10%. That's what God's Word believes in or, 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 or teaches us. And so I think it's important for us as a church to share in the vision. Don't sit here every Sunday, and I know some of you donate. Uh, many people have it set up where uh, through our, our Easy Tithe system where it just comes out of your paycheck every week. That's awesome. And, and so I know that when that offering plate goes by, some of you just pass the plate because you're giving electronically, and that's, that's cool. We appreciate that because a lot of people, they don't give if they're not here. And when you set up the system that way, you're giving whether you're here or not. And we appreciate that because this is, this is not a form of entertainment that you're paying us for the service that we provided. This is a house and a family that we have needs even when you're not here, that we need you to set it up where you're giving even on the weeks that you're not here. And that's a huge blessing. Well, there's a number of people that just every week they, they have no thought to just taking that plate and passing it by and taking it and passing it and never participate. I want to challenge you. Don't ever let an offering plate go by without participating in these laws of giving and receiving. Uh, my wife and I, like I said, we've been doing it for years and years, and God has blessed us incredibly. And you may have the mentality, oh, somebody else will take care of that. I want to tell you something. Somebody else doesn't exist. You are somebody else. Amen? You might think you're something else, but you're somebody else. Amen? And we need everybody. We need everybody to pitch in. And I loved Spencer's offering video last Sunday. You may think that you have very little or nothing to give, but God can take what you give. It's not the amount that you give. It's the heart that you give. It's the fact that you give. And he can take it and multiply it. But all of us need to participate in this. All of us need to. You know, you may not think you have money, but just look at your life. Maybe you're spending money eating out a couple times a week or Starbucks or you go to the movies or you rent a movie on pay-per-view at, uh, at home on TV or there's some habit or something in your life that you think, I, you know, I could take that and make that sacrifice and give that money to God. God will honor that. And I'm not saying that, again, because I'm, I'm greedy for your money. I want to see you blessed. I've watched so many of you struggle week after week, month after month, year after year. And it's because you're not letting God into your finances. You're not letting God help you with your money. You're not letting him cover your finances through this system of giving and receiving. But even in that, when you build a church building, I believe it's the responsibility of all of us to share the vision. Look what it says here in Exodus 36. They were building the tabernacle. And it says, they received from Moses all the offerings which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service, making the sanctuary. So they continued bringing to him free will offerings every morning. Then all the craftsmen who were doing all the work of the sanctuary came, each from the work he was doing. And they spoke to Moses, saying, the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord has commanded us to do. Wouldn't that be great? To have everybody just pitching in and saying, you know what, uh, we got more than enough. You guys, you can stop now. We've got, we've got all that we need. We've got more than what we need. That would be so awesome. And you'll have other opportunities. I, we've hired a builder that will really work with us. And, you know, he said, Pastor, if your people can chip in and, and volunteer and help out and do unskilled things, you can save a lot of money. Things like just cleaning af up after the construction crew every day or hauling things to a dumpster or, or, or just simple little things that if you've got time, say, Pastor, we're, we're building the building. I want to come by. Let let me know what, what I can do to help. Some of you have skilled trades and, and abilities that we can save a, a ton of money by, by getting you involved and, and helping. And I believe this is part of God's plan. We can do this, but we all have to step up. And if we do, we should have more than enough to be able to do it. In Galatians chapter two and, and excuse me, chapter six and verse two, the New Living Translation says, share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. I know, I love the New Living Translation. That's that verse that you think somebody else will do it. You're not that important. You are the somebody else that God wants to use. And I got to tell you, help me in this because I'm, I'm the type of person that sometimes I want to 
take the burden and put it all on my shoulders and carry it. And I got to tell you, I've already had a couple nights where I've tossed and turned and Lord, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? And I've had some moments where I'm like, Lord Jesus, this is big. I need your help. I need you to help me carry this burden and share this burden and bear this burden. And there's a lot of ways that you can do it, obviously through prayer. You can do it through prayer. You can do it just by being here. Like I said, most people don't don't put in the offering plate if they're not here. Just be here. It helps us to grow the church when new people come in and you're here to welcome them, to greet them, to introduce yourself to them. Maybe there's somebody that, that's new to the church and they're looking for somebody that, that's like them and you're you're just like them. Maybe you're, 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 you're the same age or you have the same... Uh, 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 interests and hobbies or you're the same ethnicity or the whatever it might be you're just a blessing just by being here and certainly there there's a lot of giving that goes beyond uh, just the offering plate you can invite family and friends to the church and help us to grow the church because as we grow the church we grow our resources amen this is something that is far greater than just a few of us but it's not greater than all of our faith and resources combined we can't do this though on chance We have to do this on community chest. I don't want to say, God, we're taking a chance. I want to say, God, we've got great people and and, and great resources. And I know together, if we combine our faith and our prayer and our resources and our efforts and our work and we work together, there's nothing that's impossible. I think of the story of the Tower of Babel. and God saw the people all working together and he says, man, if they work like this, there's nothing that's impossible to them. And I believe that there's nothing that's impossible to the children of God if we work together and pray together. Here's the good news. If we share in the vision and we share in the burden, we will share in the blessing. We will share in the blessing. If you looked at our our two texts here in Acts this morning, the people, it says, first of all, they were filled with awe. There will be just an awe at what God will do through this program this year, through our vision this year, through this this process this year. We will stand back and go, wow, God, look at what you did. Look at how awesome you are. Look at how big that you are. And in, in these two passages of Scripture, it talks about the miracles that happen. When you begin to stretch your faith and you begin to ask God to be involved in your life, in every area of your life, especially the financial area of your life, miracles will begin to happen. You know, the Bible teaches where our tr- treasure is there our heart is also you may say pastor i don't like to talk about money money is a very important subject to god because it's a barometer and an indicator of our faith if god can't let uh, get you to let go of your money chances are he's not going to get you to let go of other areas of your life god wants to do miracles in your life but he can't until you let go and letting go of our finances and giving him control is a great indicator that we're going to be willing to let go of every area of our life to god amen and so I, i encourage we do this, this is a long-standing tradition here, that when you fill out your offering envelope, whatever miracle you're believing God for, whatever it is you're looking to be blessed and asking God to provide for you, write it on the back of your envelope. Write it somewhere on your envelope and say, God, I'm planting this seed in faith, believing that this need will be met into my life. That, that God, I'm giving you control of every area of my life and opening my heart to your miracles. It says that great grace in one passage and the other great power was upon them all. That when we share in the burden and we share in the vision there will be great grace and great power that comes upon each and every one of us how many of you would like more grace and power in your life amen, amen. god wants to overwhelm you with power god wants to do miracles he wants to overwhelm you with grace and then the last thing that we see in these passages is the church exploded with growth the church began to explode with growth this church is going to explode with growth i'm just going to speak it and prophesy it right now you know people all over town is going to be talking about liberty church and you're going to be able to say that's my church that's where i go to church that's where i worship you're going to be able to tell them the presence of god that you feel here every sunday you're going to be able to tell them the words of god that are spoken here every sunday you're going to be able to say man that's my church look at what god did with my family look at what god did with my church look at what god has done in my life hallelujah in Isaiah chapter 54 I love this scripture God speaks and I believe this is a word for us he says enlarge your house build an addition spread out your home and spare no expense for you will soon be bursting at the seams that's what I believe amen Amen. God is going to cause us to be bursting at the seams as we combine our faith together you'll find the power in combined faith the power in this community chest of faith 
That if we begin to, to say the same things and speak the same things and believe for the same things and, and work towards the same thing, you'll begin to see this thing develop right before your very eyes. And I wouldn't have, I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't have made this step of faith with our church six or seven years ago because we had too many negative people. We had too many grumblers and complainers. Too many people that, that I know would have been talking behind the scenes and stabbing me in the back and trying to undercut what we're trying to do here because that's just the way that people were. But as I look out among our church today, we've got positive people. We've got faith people. We've got people that love. We've got people that serve. We've got givers. We've got people that, that God is going to use. And as we combine our faith together and begin to pray together, God will do incredible things. So first of all, faith prays together. One person's faith is not big enough for this. We need to all be praying together. I ask you, to pray for this vision every day. I covet your prayers. We need your prayers. Don't let me be the only one praying. Don't let our staff be the only people praying. Let's all pray together for this. Secondly, faith stays together. What do I mean by that? I mean that it endures opposition. Because as we begin to step out to do this, can I just tell you something? We're going to get attacked. There's going to be opposition. When Nehemiah went back uh, to, to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall, there was an enemy that stood there and watched him as they started to build. And he taunted him. The enemy uh, uh, intimidated them. The enemy told them, you can't do it. You're not going to make it. The enemy put fear in them to the point where they stopped building at one point. But I love what it says in Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 16. It says, but from then on, only half of my men worked, while the other half stood guard with spears and shields and bows and coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting the load and the other hand holding a weapon. Hallelujah. As we, we endure this project, with one hand, we're going to be working on the project and, and, and helping it happen. But with the other hand, they had a, a sword. They had a weapon in the other hand because we're going to have to fight off the enemy with the other hand. He's going to come in and attack. He's going to come in to discourage. He's going to come in to divide. He's going to come in to steal resources. And so we're praying and we're working and we're believing with the hand of faith. But with this other hand, we've got to be fighting off those, those negative thoughts and the attacks of the enemy. And this is the way it is with life. There's an enemy out there and he's rear, real and he Rome's about trying to devour the things that God wants to do. And finally, faith plays together. We're going to have so much fun. The word community comes from the word communion. We're going to have deeper relationships than we've ever had before. We're going to see our, our, our hearts grow together, our love grow together. We're going to see the joy of the Lord explode in our church. I can't wait for that that day where we, we cut the ribbon uh, on a new building. And we go in, and, and I, I just tell you that we've already got plans. Before we invite anybody from the community in, we're going to go in there and just blow the lid off that place and worship. We're just going to go in and praise and thank God for what He's done in our lives. I've already told Stephen that when we open the door to the, our new children's facility, I want Gideon to cut the ribbon on that one. Amen? I, I, I want to see him just come in and say, look what God, our God is a God of miracles. Amen? And I tell you, we're going to have just a great celebration. We're going to do some awesome things in that new building, and we're going to have just a great time. Praise the Lord. Well, Father, we thank you for your goodness. I pray, God, today that this message was received with the heart that it was intended, Lord. That, God, we're in this together, that we're a family. God, I'm so excited about where you're taking us, Lord. But I'm at the same time nervous. And I, I must admit, a, a little fearful, Lord. I think of the man that says, I believe. Help my unbelief, Lord. God, I, I pray and I know that if we're in this together, nothing's impossible to us. We can do this, Lord. And I just pray today, God, that you would speak to the hearts of the people that are here, Lord, and help us to step up together and believe together and, and, and do this together and celebrate it together. Pray together, Lord God. Work together for your glory and for your honor, Father. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen.